Richard, Richard, <laughs> here was this unique moment when somebody from Imperial Vienna in the late 19th century, schooled in the most avant-garde uh, cultural uh, practices of the time, leaves and comes to America, the land of opportunity, and not just the land of opportunity, but a land where the climate, um, which was not talked about, you talked about it, but it seems to me that the combination of the American wealth, the American willingness to take, uh, to take risks, and the climate allowed this extraordinary thing to happen in the 30s and the 40s. Absolutely. I mean, uh, you could say that in, in North America, this axis of the Europeans. You could say that uh, in, uh, in closer. Okay. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, you could say that in North America, the this kind of axis of people coming from Europe, but particularly in this period from Vienna, actually through Chicago and then through the influence of architects in Chicago out to Los Angeles produced some of the most important architecture, or probably the most important architecture, in my opinion, in the 20th century. Um, uh, I know when I was a student of architecture, the first architect that captured my curiosity and fascination, both as a theorist and as an architect, was Adolf Loos. And then probably, in terms of a contemporary architecture, uh, uh, Frank Gehry, who was not actually, because I'm old enough, he wasn't actually that well known. Um, and so for me, I tried to connect the dots between those two people, uh, and the dots then run through, you know, Wright, uh, Neutra, uh, Schindler, and then all the, all the generation of people that came out of Neutra's office uh, that were teaching at UCLA uh, and were the teachers of Frank Gehry. So uh, so you, you have this whole this whole set of generations. Now, when I was coming up, Schindler was considered the more avant-gardist and. Um, interesting figure because actually the architecture of his houses is a little bit more experimental in some ways. But what I think this film revealed, which is, uh, is extremely important and it's woven through the film very well and you just alluded to it, is uh, Neutra's relationship uh, to the landscape. Uh, and in fact, the film starts and ends there with this cemetery, which I, I did not know about. Um, so, uh, and this interpenetration of architecture and the landscape, which is now being investigated through neuroscience and other things about, uh, in, in terms of the, uh, its effect on human consciousness. And this is something that was very important to Neutra, and I think uh, in the previous generations was a little bit under-discovered or known. So Richard, could, could Neutra have had the career that he had in the US if he had stayed in Europe? I mean, it seems to me that, that, that there was something about the chemistry between him, what he knew, what he wanted to do, and what he could do that, that, that couldn't have happened anywhere else. I mean, if he had come to Canada, for no, example. No, but it's also timing, because when he came in this period in the, in the, in the, in, and, and had these opportunities in the 20s and 30s, there was that openness, uh, particularly in Los Angeles. There were a lot of other uh, European immigrants who had come there and, and Film and music, so there was a there was a, a there was the physical there was the you know the environmental uh, physical climate, but there was also the culture. Mendelssohn, who we had worked with, came, only came after had came during the, the, the you know during the, the, the Nazi era. He had to escape, and he was never able to reconstruct his career uh, at the level that he had had it in Germany, in the United States, because he didn't have he didn't have that that set of, that network. So that it's it's not only the opportunity of, 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 the United, of those parts of the United States at the time, but it's also the timing. But Richard, talk to us a little bit about the fact that you know, you, you've grown up in Vienna, they have winter there, they have snow, they have bad weather, and then you suddenly find yourself in Southern, Southern California where it's the sun shines every day, and it's always beautiful, and it's always warm, and suddenly it's sort of like all those technical demands that architecture has to meet you know, short of gravity, um, have been removed from the equation and you're free to do what you want to go crazy. And you look at something like the Kaufman House and some of the other ones, and you, you sort of sense that this man had, had a, uh, suddenly had a freedom to do things that he could never have done in Europe. I, exactly. I mean, and, and the Schindler houses are made out of cardboard and, you know, and, 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 and sticks. I mean, Wasn't the Schindler's house that collapsed uh, uh, the first window? Yes. 
pieces of them. Yeah. But yes, it's, it's true, and this, and this experimentation with the ability to live in the landscape, if you look at falling water, uh, Wright had this idea that you're sort of living in nature, but the European idea was a very different one. You are clearly in a, in a, in a kind of cocoon-like artificial environment that then inter it has a kind of, kind of interpenetration uh, visually and otherwise in a middle zone with the landscape. So, uh, and uh, uh, Neutra developed those specific details like the, the glass corner to achieve that, 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 those two doors we saw open. The, the details were developed in the service of that idea. Um, yeah. One, one thing the film stays away from a little bit, which is maybe why when I was coming up, Neutra was a, the less favorite figure in this kind of competition between Neutra and Schindler, is he went on after doing these remarkable houses to have a very successful and big commercial practice. And the, the church is not the only large building he did. Um, and uh, there were a lot of big building, you know, institutional buildings, commercial buildings. And so he built a, uh, a more successful than a more commercial uh, a practice. And some of the larger buildings were, were not considered bad works of architecture, but like any commission that has to deal with difficult you know, institutional or, 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 or commercial demands, they were not as, as adventurous, right? So the, the arc of his career and the scale of his practice um, was larger, uh, but also became more conventional later in, in, in life. And the film doesn't cap, it captures the church, but there are other buildings, so, right? So let's talk about that church for a second, because it, the temptation is to laugh at it, not for architectural reasons, mm -hmm. Uh, because it's looked like quite a beautiful building to me. But the idea of this drive-through church, I mean, it seems kind of uh, to pre uh, predict and sort of, it seems like a step on the way to Donald Trump kind of thing. It seems so perverse. And it seems such a kind of um, um, perversion of Christianity. I don't know why. I guess it's a good thing to be able to go to a church service and sit in your car. Well, uh, actually, Philip Johnson topped that because he did a drive-in one. Yeah, right. The big so, last one. Yeah, yes. So, so it, it kept this idea kept going, right? And now you now you have very little architecture with the mega church, but you still have the, the, but, per, the program has become even more perverse. But I mean, when you look at those early buildings <laughs> and you see that there's clearly some kind of um, idealistic uh, thinking, I mean, this desire, maybe not to meld with nature, but a deep awareness of nature, a deep sensitivity to it, uh, to architecture put in the service of these utterly banal programs. Um, is, is that, I mean, is this the fate that all architects, successful architects, face? That they have? To, is this what happened to Neutra? Well, the, I mean, we have some some spectacular examples here. If you think about, you know, uh, the design of space for hospitals or care facilities, the same principles you see at work in those houses should be pursued and is being pursued for those. We have we have spaces where you know where there are therapeutic spaces in hospitals, where there are outdoor terraces. There's a long tradition of these. I'm not saying well, <laughs> that's not hard to justify. What? That's, those kinds of things aren't hard to justify. No, they're this important. Is, yes, of course. Yeah. I, I'm just saying. Uh, I mean, when it gets to the point where where you you know you, you, it's too much to ask uh, somebody, a worshiper, to get out of his uh, out of his car uh, to go <laughs> into the. I mean, surely there's something wrong with that picture. Well, no you, matter how beautiful you the architecture may be. Why can't you pray in your car? Right? <laughs> there, there are a lot of reasons I, I would say. And, 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 and in this period, many other things happen in cars. So. <laughs> well, I think we should. I think we should try to figure out from PJ here. I mean, you had to do a lot. I mean. I, I hadn't realized how international Neutra's career was. I think of him, I think of California, but that's not the case. Um, right. I, I think like the big difference for me between Neutra and Schindler was that um, Schindler got out of Austria before World, World War I and he was working with Frank Lloyd Wright. Neutra was in the war, so some of his uh, uh, and I, I have interviews of people talking about how he was at the outpost and he would, so he had to design a certain thing to keep the you know enemies away and 
be alerted when they're coming. And then after the war ended, he studied under the landscape architect in uh, Zurich, uh, Gustav Amann. And then Neutra went to Berlin and he was part of the whole kind of uh, the Bauhaus and the simple designs and the be efficient with materials and Schindler was already in California. I guess I guess that, that sort of early time that he spent with landscape architecture turned out, um, whether he knew it or not, to have played a really seminal role in, in his work. Yes, and that kind of differentiated him from a lot of his Did he really think that, that 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 work, the, the, the funeral, of the cemetery in the woods, I mean, it sounds like he had this feeling that his best work was his first work. I mean, some architects are in that position. For example, Moshe Safdie, I shouldn't say this, but... Go ahead. Go ahead. I mean, <laughs> Habitat. Habitat is the one, you know, great thing that he's done. I, I would say, as much as I love that man, I think he's a wonderful human being. But it's one of those things, you know, like Richard was talking about Frank Geary. Frank Geary did shopping malls and things like that for years. His, his best work is probably still to come. Uh, other architects aren't in that position. It, but what about Neutra? How does he fit in there? Um, well, Barbara Lamprecht, who wrote the Taschen book, Neutra Complete Works, uh, she didn't even include the Luckenwalde Cemetery. Really? And uh, she realized later that that was probably his most important work. And when I first met Barbara, I was like, okay, I'm doing this Neutra film, and I want you to be in it, and what is the most important thing that you would want to talk about, about Neutra? And she said his uh, biorealism and neuroscience and, and that. And, I, and then I said, if there is a God, where would you want to tell this story? And she said, that the Luckenwalde Cemetery. So I made that happen, and that Having her involved just opened a lot of doors. And also as a director, then I didn't have to know everything because you get these people that are the experts and you go, okay, rolling. <laughs> what's really interesting about my design, what's really interesting about the design of the cemetery and just that as a program and a theme and the kind of, uh, the, the fact that for whatever reason, whatever requirement, it, it was designed in a more traditional style. Uh, What's interesting about it is that the, the moment we associated with the height of Neutra's career with that kind of white, uh, sleek, crystal-like architecture um, is very hard to maintain in time. Uh, you see when, you, when they were doing the renovations, you think of these things made out of like, um, you know, uh, formica and ether, right? Uh, yet they're brick. And they and you see the stains on the wall, and it's very hard. It's it, the, that that project. I don't know what how, what gazillion amount of dollars it cost for that that those people to restore the Kaufman House. A lot of money. Um, but it's it's like a large piece of furniture, and and then to maintain it in that pristine form yeah. is quite difficult. So I think what we realize when you see things like cemetery is they're is they're really about marking the passage of time, right? Uh, and they are more a lot. You know, even though it's a place where there's dead people, they, they have a kind of romantic aliveness to them that some of these kind of very, very high works of modernism from the from the 20s, uh, you know, it's odd that, that the son, they, they rebuilt the house and it became his kind of, he was kind of trapped in it for the rest of his life, right? Yeah. <laughs> so so there, there's, there's that as well. There, there's a kind of, as you said, an idealism that architecture from the 20s and 30s, which is trying in its own way to be timeless, um, but uh, but the, the cemetery actually engages the, 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 the span of, of, of lives and humanity. And is allowed to grow and right, change right, as right. part of the thing. This, you know what? We have to end now. I'm getting signals that our time is up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.